The God whom we read about in the Bible, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one and only, what is he really like? That's what we're studying on our program. I invite you to stay tuned. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love Welcome to The Truth in Love, and now your host, Dave Miller. Great pleasure to see you today. I hope you have your Bible and will turn in your Old Testament to the book of Numbers in our series on who God is. We've been looking at specific historical incidents, looking at how uh, God deals with people, His own people, how He interacts with them, how He reacts to them, how He views sin, with our ultimate objective being to understand who God is, what He's really like. Because it seems to me, many people have a defective view of God. That's clearly the case based upon the kinds of statements that are made by them, even in view of the fact that they're living extremely wicked lives. I was watching one of these just bits and pieces of one of these uh, Hollywood uh, award shows. And there are uh, women who, who have fewer things covered than they have on, very, wear very little clothing. Uh, there are people who sing popular songs that are filled with references to wickedness in an, in an approving way. And yet these people will receive their reward and thank God and speak about how God has been good to them. That's just one example of many examples in American culture right now in our history where people claim to be religious. They claim to be living their lives devoted to the God of the universe. And yet it is clear by the claims which they make and the lives which they live they don't know who God is. They have created a God in their own image. They have a defective view of the God of the Bible and the religion of the Bible and how God interacts with people and how He expects us to live. So, the only way for you and me to know who God is, to become acquainted with God, is to allow His Holy Spirit to tell us who God is and what He expects of us. Do you know that the Bible is the product of the Holy Spirit? Read carefully 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Read 2 Peter 3, 16. All Scripture is inspired of God. God breathed. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. Read John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus said, I'll send the Holy Spirit back to you apostles to empower you to write Scripture, to speak the words of God. The 66 books of our Bibles are the inspired revelation of God through the Holy Spirit. Here is the only access we have to who God is. If you don't study the Bible, you can't know who God is. Here is the divine source. The scriptures will help us to grasp the very essence, the very nature, and the very character of God. I plead with you, I beg you, to stop listening to people and forming your views based upon your observations and your own subjective experience. Form your views, determine your future, what you believe, how you live, based upon what God tells you in His Word. Every single word in the Bible is inspired of God and calculated to instruct us. Even though there are sections in the Bible that do not have direct application today. For example, the Old Testament was written to the Jewish nation pre-cross, pre-Christ. Therefore, it only has application today by way of, um, you know, application, uh, relevant principles, but the specifics of animal sacrifice, uh, Sabbath observance, and a host of other things don't apply today. But when we study the Old Testament, there's much that does apply. We learn who God is, how He views sin, how He views us, how He wants us to behave. The fact that He requires us to live our lives in harmony with His will. That brings us to Numbers chapter 16. In our last program, we saw the children of Israel fail to obey God and go in and conquer the promised land. So God doomed them to wandering in the desert for 40 years till the older generation, anybody over 20, 20 or over, had died off. Here we are in the midst of this wilderness wandering. 
And in chapter 16, the people haven't learned their lesson yet. So typical of people. We are informed that Korah, who was from the tribe of Levi, in fact, he was a Kohathite. He was the son of Kohath. The Kohathite clan of the tribe of Levi was commissioned by God with some very responsible roles. Do you understand that God told the Kohathites that they were responsible for actually uh, transporting portions of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. This was uh, prestigious, very important work. But here we are informed in chapter 16 that Korah, in league with two men from the tribe of Reuben, Doth, Doth, uh, Dathan and Abiram, these three men approach Moses along with 250 leaders of the congregation. These would be uh, council members, uh, men, representatives of the people. Uh, these men held some prestige. They were popular men, men of renown, the text says in the New King James Version. 250 plus Korah, Dathan, and Byron, they all gather against Moses and Aaron. And here's what they say. You have uh, taken too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? You know, Moses and Aaron were the leaders of the nation. Moses, the civil, political, uh, religious leader. Aaron, the priestly leader. They were the leaders of the nation of Israel. Why? How'd they get there? Who put them there? And yet here these fellows come and say, you know, you guys think, you, think a lot of yourselves. You're, you've really put yourselves up in a high position. But we are good people. We're holy people. We're Israelites. We... We have a right to have a uh, sense of authority as well as you. Well, Moses is really quite devastated. He is, uh, he's hurt by this. And so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he says to Korah, Tomorrow you come and we'll let the Lord settle this. And as you read down through this chapter, he tells them to bring their censers, which for the, were the, for the purpose of burning incense, and we will let God settle who is the appropriate leaders and who is not. Well, in the meantime, Moses says to Korah, Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself? See, Korah had very responsible activities that enabled him to come to God in worship in ways that the average Israelite was not permitted to come. To do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation, to serve them, and that He's brought you near to Himself, you and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you also seeking the priesthood? Are you wanting to take away from Aaron the responsibilities that God has assigned him to? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. Notice that. Folks, there are many times where we oppose one another, where we attack a fellow Christian and we're thinking, you know, I have a right to do this. It's me against him. Moses says, you're not attacking Mo me and Aaron. You're attacking the Lord. You've arrayed yourselves. You've assembled yourselves in opposition to God. Man, that's a critical concept that we need to face today. Well, notice. Then Moses calls or sends for Dathan and Abiram. They apparently went back to their tent. So Moses sends a message to them. Come and let's talk this over. And look at their reaction. We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land, uh, out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Isn't that enough? As if it's Moses' fault that they didn't go into the land that flowed with milk and honey. We saw in chapter 14 last in our last session together, that was their fault that they didn't go in and take it. So is that not enough that you should also keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. That's euphemistic terminology. Are you going to enslave us? Are you going to suppress us and hold us down? Well, Moses became very angry when they said, We will not come up to you. And he turned to God and he said, don't respect their offering. I've not done anything to these men. I've not so much as taken a donkey from them. I've not hurt any of them. Then Moses turns to, to Korah, the leader, the ringleader of this whole thing. He says, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Each of you take a censer, put incense in it. Each of you bring a censer before the Lord. All 250 of the princes bring their censers. 
Aaron and each of you with his censer, every, and so the text says, every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. That's the next day, 24 hours later. Do you know in the meantime, Kor and these other men apparently did a lot of talking to stir up support for their view and their side. So much so that in verse 19 of number 16, Korah gathered all the congregation against them, that is against Moses and Aaron, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And listen to what God says. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. We must pause and ask the question, is that the God that you have always claimed to follow and to believe in? Is this the God that you have chosen to devote your life to? Or have you understood God to be someone other than the one that we've just had depicted for us? Here these men come up and they say, look, we want more prominent positions in the nation. What's wrong with that? And God says, I didn't put you in that position. Fellas, you step over here and we'll just put an end to this whole bunch right now. That's the God of the universe. Was that cruel, mean, unkind? Absolutely not. Totally just, totally appropriate. God would never do anything unloving or inappropriate. God is perfect. He's infinite in all of His attributes. Therefore, this action calling for the death of all of these perpetrators was not in any way an ungracious or unloving or inappropriate action. Now we have to come to grips with that. We must melt our spirits, melt our hearts, our minds, and mold them around the will of God, the Word of God, the views of God. We need to make certain that the, the religion that we are following and the God whom we've embraced by the way we live is indeed the God we read about in the Bible. Well, notice, um, Moses falls upon his face once again, he and Aaron. O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation. Once again, Moses, notice how loving Moses is. It would have been easy for him to say, that's right, God, do it. Wipe these guys out. Uh, well, I've had it with these people. They're always challenging me and giving me a hard time. They attack Moses personally. Moses loved these people enough and cared for them that he begged God to not destroy the whole bunch of them, especially when there was basically one ringleader. So here's what the Lord said. This is verse 24. Speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose, went to Dathan and Abiram. The elders of Israel followed him. He spoke to the congregation. Here's what he said. Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So the people began moving away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram came out of their tents. They were in their tents at the time. They came out, stood by the door of their tents. They had some of their family members there. Notice these family members were under the same injunction that everybody else was under. Get away from these men because of their rebellious uh, conspiracy. But obviously some of the family members chose to side with their relatives. Think about that. Well, don't touch anything lest you be consumed with their sins. Then Moses said, here's how you're going to know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, that I've not done anything here of my own will or my own accord. I'm simply representing God. Then he goes ahead and explains how, you know, if these men go on and, and they live long lives and die natural deaths, then that's proof that I'm wrong. But if on the other hand, these rebels, these men who have challenged my authority from God, if they die in a most unusual way, in fact, he goes in and tells them, if in fact the ground opens up, splits open, and swallows these men up, then you're going to know that they have been wrong, that they have taken a false view, and that God has set things up the way He wants it, and they, on the other hand, have rejected God. Notice verse 30. Understand that these men have rejected the Lord. You know, if you'd gone those men and said, do you, do you guys believe in God? If you rejected God, they'd say, sure we believe in God. We haven't rejected God. We just, we're rejecting Moses' leadership. 
No, God authorized Moses to be in that position. You reject him, you reject God. And God takes it personal and reacts accordingly. It came to pass as he finished speaking all these words, guess what happened? Verse 31, the ground split apart under them, the earth opened its mouth, swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. They went down, the text says, they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, they perished from among the congregation. Ask yourself the question, who is God that he would do that? But that's not all. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry. See, these men, when that ground started vibrating and splitting open and they started going down, they started screaming their heads off. Those screams and what the, everybody else was observing caused them to run in every direction, scared to death. Lest, they said, the earth swallow us up also. Verse 34, verse 35, and a fire. Now listen to this, the 250 leaders, council members that participated in this coup, they weren't swallowed up by the ground. Notice what happens to them. A fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then God gives instructions to Moses and Aaron to take the censers that those 250 men had used and beat them and pound them into uh, flat pieces of gold uh, to be used in tabernacle service. And so uh, they did that. Look what happens the very next day, verse 41. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and look at what they accuse them of. You have killed the people of the Lord. You guys are responsible for Korah, Dathan, and Byron getting swallowed up. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron. They turned toward the tabernacle of the meeting. Suddenly the cloud covered it. Here's God manifesting His presence again. Guess what God says again, verse 44. The Lord said to Moses, verse 45, Get away from this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Same thing he told the other group. God was prepared, willing to destroy the nation once again. He threatens to do so because of their violation of his will and their unwillingness to conform. Once again, Moses begs God not to do that. Then he turns to his brother Aaron and says, Please go get your censer. Get some incense, start burning it, and offer atonement at the tabernacle in behalf of all these people. He runs in obedience to his younger brother and begins doing that. And you know, the text says atonement occurred and a plague that God had perpetrated against all of those, that entire congregation, a plague that infiltrated the nation was stayed. It was stopped because of the atoning intermediary action on the part of Aaron, but listen closely. Verse 46, wrath has gone out from the Lord. And verse 48, he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stopped. Now listen to verse 49. Those who died in the plague were 14,700 in addition to those who died in the Korah incident. Is this shocking to you? Doesn't this sound a little bit uh, barbaric? It, it, I've, I've even read liberal theologians who have said, uh, that's uncivilized, that's uh, unchristian. That is a pre-Christian God, not the God we read about in the Bible. That's not what Jesus is. The cross has stopped all that kind of thing. That can't be true. God is God. Oh, I'll grant you God doesn't necessarily react immediately and strike people dead as He did at that point in history. Although when we go to the New Testament in a later program, we'll see that He did then too. But God doesn't change His view of sin, His attitude toward it, how He deals with people ultimately in terms of His favor or His disapproval. None of that's changed. This is God. Why do you suppose these, these chapters are even in the Bible? Do they have relevance to us? What are you supposed to learn from number 16? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the ground swallowing up, 14,700 people dying from a plague. What am I to learn from that? What, what relevance does that have to me and you and Christianity today? Some people would conclude none. That's irrelevant. That's totally contrary to my understanding of who God is and, and what Christ is all about in Christianity. Folks, I'm telling you then, you have a defective view of God. And you don't understand. And Jesus Christ. You don't understand Christianity because the central attributes of God 
His compassion, His grace, His forgiveness, His wrath, His justice, His righteousness. These are all the same. These have not changed. We must adjust our misconceptions and bring them into harmony with, bring them into line with these texts which show, so clearly divulge to us who God is, what God is really like. I want to take you to another chapter quickly in the few minutes that we have remaining. Flip on over to chapter 20. You know, Numbers is full of this. And it's interesting that the New Testament makes clear that Numbers is describing a period in Israelite history that has direct relevance to us. When you come on over to uh, chapter 20, Moses himself is, uh, is permitted. He allows himself to be goaded into sin so that he himself is banned from entering into the promised land. Can you believe that? That God would take this great servant who back in chapter 12, we're told was the meekest, humblest man on the face of the planet. God says, that's it. You're not going into the promised land. I don't think that meant that he was barred from heaven, but the God of the universe forbade Moses from going into the promised land. We come in to uh, chapter 21 where we have this incident where they're still wandering out in the desert. It's near the end of the 40 year period and they're very discouraged. Look at chapter 21 verse four, discouraged because of the harsh, rugged desert conditions that they're having to endure. And so verse five, the people speak against God. They speak against Moses. What do you mean? What did they say? We we're told what they said. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, no water. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. Talking about the manna that God miraculously gave them out of His gracious kindness. Granted, it was repetitive for a 40-year period. But that doesn't mean that we should get sick of it and say, that's it, I don't want that. Forget that, God. We should be grateful for all that God gives us. Do you know the Lord sent, the text says, fiery serpents in the Old Testament, uh, the King James Version, uh, we would say poisonous snakes, venomous snakes. God sends snakes that go in among the population and start biting and killing people. Oh, they repent then. They turn to God and beg for forgiveness. And God says to Moses, all right, construct a pole, a brass pole, bronze pole, wrap a bronze snake around it, set it at a strategic location within the camp. Everybody that comes to that location and looks upon that object will be cleansed or healed of the snake bite. Notice. God did not remove the snakes. He didn't say, okay, uh, I forgive you. I'll take all the snakes away. No, He left the snakes there. But He provided a healing me a means by which the effects of the snake bite could be overcome. But here is, once again, our big question. What kind of a God, when people simply, orally, verbally complain and grumble? And why did they grumble? Because they were in harsh desert condition. Man, it was dry, it was hot, it was dusty. Day after day, week after week, year after year, for 40 years they're wandering in this desert. They're discouraged. Don't you ever get discouraged? Certainly. Does the Bible condemn discouragement? No. That's normal, that's human. God understands that. He provides us the solution to discouragement, the antidote. But notice the problem was not the discouragement, but what they did out of their discouragement. They began to grumble and complain against Moses and God and blame them for their predicament. That seems like really a pretty simple thing. That doesn't seem that drastic. Most of us do that every day. But let me tell you something. God sent poisonous snakes in. Those snakes started biting and killing people. Thousands died. That's the God of the universe. That's the God of the New Testament. That's the Father of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus was in on all of this in the Old Testament, according to 1 Corinthians 10 and many other passages. Jesus didn't just suddenly appear in New Testament times and change everything. Jesus is God. God and Christ are one. The Holy Spirit, that's deity. This is deity. We must understand who God is. Only if you have an accurate assessment of who God is, a wholesome a complete healthy view of who God is. Will you be in a position to make the right decisions and to live your life appropriately today so that you can be saved and live with God forever? I hope you'll stay tuned. I want to make this material available to you free. So please don't go away. I'll be back in just a moment. Sweet is the soul.
the New Testament teaches that the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is living and active. The word active is from the Greek word energes, energetic. Romans 1.16, the gospel is dunamis, power, dynamite. We glean sustenance for our spirits, our souls, and our lives when we go back and peruse the pages of inspired writ and grasp who God is and His relationship to us. I hope you're enjoying this study. We'll continue it next week. In the meantime, feel free to write me this week at The Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. And you may request the series entitled, Who is God? We'll send you audio cassette tapes. Videotapes are available at a nominal charge just for cost. We'll send you the audio tapes free. We're happy to assist you in your study of the Word of God. May God bless you. Hope to see you again soon. Revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in